Continuing on from the previous video where we calculated the Bohr radius for a hydrogen atom under the Bohr model, we're going to now move on to the energy. So the total energy, E, is just going to be the sum of the kinetic energy, T, and potential energy, V. So for this specific instance, as it is for many others, the kinetic energy is just one-half mv squared. And in this case, the m we're interested in is mass of the electron, me. Then the potential energy is the Coulomb potential acting between the electron and the proton, which is just the product of their charges over 4 pi epsilon naught times their distance apart. It's negative because they have opposite signs on their charges, therefore positive times a negative is going to give you a negative. And we know what the radius is from the previous video. We calculated that. Um, there are some quantities here which we don't know, but we can get from other methods. So we had in the previous video an equation which made the forces acting on the electron equal out. So one force acting on it is a Coulomb force pulling it in. It's attraction to the proton, which follows Coulomb's law there. And the other is a centrifugal force trying to pull it away, trying to make it not rotate in a rotating reference frame. And then that was equal to its mass times velocity squared over radius. So we can see that we've got an r squared over here and an r right there. So let's cancel out that r, cancel out that squared. And what we can see right now is we have this mev squared that we have up here, MeV squared. So let's just substitute, substitute in this value here, uh, in, up in this equation here. So now our total energy is just going to equal 1 half this quantity E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught R minus 1 times the same value. which is just going to give us minus one half this value or similarly we can just put the two with the four down there we can have it be minus e squared over eight pi epsilon naught r okay so now we have the Bohr radius which will remind ourselves from the previous video what that value was in terms of physical constants. Let's look down here. We have that that was 4 pi epsilon naught squared h bar squared n squared over mass of the electron squared times charge of the electron squared. And remember n is just an integer which has a value which is greater than zero. So the lowest value can be is one and it can be any value larger than one. So let's flip that around. So one over r is going to be me e squared over four pi epsilon naught h bar squared n squared. So substituting this in up there we're going to have E equals the same things we have E squared over 8 pi epsilon naught then multiplied times the 1 over R part ME E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught H bar squared N squared <coughs> so the final expression we're gonna get is that dividing a line here E equals minus ME E to the fourth over 8 times 4 is going to be 32 pi squared epsilon naught squared h bar squared this these are all constants or physical constants times 1 over n squared, where n is just indicating 
the different energy levels which are available to us. So what this means is, if you want to calculate the energy levels of a hydrogen atom, you have zero, which is just a reference value for a proton and an, and an electron infinitely far apart. This value is negative, so it's an attractive energy. You gain energy by bringing the proton and electron closer to each other. There's going to be some lowest value, where n equals 1, where the energy is a minimum. Then there's going to be n equals 2, n equals 3, etc. And there's going to be a continuum of an infinite number of states approaching up to e equals 0. So those are the energy levels we get um, based, off of this, based off of the quantization that Bohr required by hypothesizing that angular momentum must be quantized. So Bohr said that there is a quantization of angular momentum, that angular momentum can only have certain allowed values, and because of that, the expression that we get for the energy of the hydrogen atom is quantized as well. It has only certain allowed values, and these allowed values are these energy levels that I've kind of crudely diagrammed out here on the right. Okay, so we can box that, because that's an interesting result. Then what we are, want to look at is uh, transitions between energy levels. So the line spectra of hydrogen atom and other atoms are generated by jumps between energy levels. So emission spectra are when you go from one level down to another. So for example, this, this, these would all be different. These are all different changes in energy, which would show up as different frequencies or wavelengths on a spectrum. And would give you the line spectra that you would see because only certain values and energy changes are allowed because only certain values and energy are allowed. So if we calculate the delta E, the change in energy between any two levels, Bohr said that this has to be equal to the energy of the photon that Einstein said has a certain energy, h nu. A single photon has the energy h nu and that when this energy change occurs, a photon is emitted with the same energy. So the change in the energy levels has to be equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon. And that's just going to be the difference between any of these two energy levels. So you'll have some constant out in front over 32 pi squared, epsilon naught squared, h bar squared. And then you'll have the difference of two energy levels, one over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. Okay, so this is starting to look quite familiar. We also know that when we were looking at the Rydberg equation before, the way we were looking at that is in terms of wave numbers. So wave number nu bar equals 1 over lambda. And we know that nu, this nu here, is equal to c over lambda. So that's just the difference of multiplying times the speed of light there. So the delta E equals h nu, which equals hc over lambda. So nu bar being 1 over lambda, nu bar is going to be equal to delta E over hc. OK, so we can start to use this. Um, Notice that we have h here, just Planck's constant, and we have the reduced Planck's constant h bar here, which those two are just related by h bar equals h over 2 pi. So getting rid of the h bar and making that an h is just going to add a 4 pi squared up at the top here. So that 4 pi squared is going to cancel with this 32 pi squared, and then this is going to become just 8 on the bottom. So we're going to have nu bar equals delta E over HC. So we're going to have our usual ME e to the fourth over, and we canceled out a 4 pi squared from having the square H bar, where this 4 pi squared is going to be on top. So we just have 8. Epsilon naught squared remains the same. This h bar squared is now just going to be an h, 
and there's another h because we're dividing by another h right there becomes h cubed and then we're dividing by the speed of light as well that's not above here so we have a c in there and then we have the standard expression 1 minus n1 squared 1 minus n2 squared where as we remind ourselves n2 is greater than n1 <coughs> n2 being the energy level you start at n1 being the energy level you end at okay so this is the Rydberg equation in terms of fundamental constants so in, er in an earlier video we talked about the Rydberg constant so here we've got me times e to the fourth over 8 epsilon naught squared Planck's constant cube times the speed of light and that value if we actually calculate it out which I'm not going to do I'll let you carry that out on your own equals 109 737 wave numbers and that is in comparison to the experimental result which is 109676 so you see that that's within about 0.5 percent of experiment and that's an incredibly accurate result given that we did not actually solve what we'll eventually see as the full quantum mechanical uh, equations for this system this is just a, a hypothesis that angular momentum should be quantized and following what the math that falls out from there and we get a value for the Rydberg constant which is got you know two decimal places which are dead on and the third isn't that bad but we can do even better so here we have the mass of the electron for the mass but we in fact know that for the electron proton system it's not really the proton isn't really stationary so the proton and the electron are both rotating around their common center of mass <coughs> So the, the electron weighs much, much less than the proton by about a factor of 2,000. So the proton moves very little, but it doesn't move, it isn't completely stationary. So the value you need to, act, in fact, substitute in here instead is not the mass of the electron. It's what is called the reduced mass, which I'm not going to mention a whole lot more about, but um, that's something you can derive as well. The reduced mass is defined as for the mass of the electron times the mass of the proton over mass of the electron plus mass of the proton. And this reduced mass would be the same for any two-body system in circular motion. It's the same for whether it was the Earth and the Moon, the Earth and the Sun, etc. So when we substitute in this mu into the Rydberg equation, which in this case for the electron proton system, mu equals in terms of mass of the electron it's very very close but not quite it's about 99.5 percent the mass of the electron so the Rydberg constant if we calculate it using the reduced mass of the electron proton system that's the only value that changes you're going to get a value of 109 6 7 6 wave numbers and now that value is extremely accurate if you compare that oh sorry the the value over here is actually an eight sorry read the wrong part of the paper okay so this is an eight but still that's a correspondence of five digits so this value is extremely extremely accurate and that's within zero point zero zero two percent error so basically Bohr had this hypothesis that angular momentum is quantized in the hydrogen atom and then following the, following the consequences of that idea leads you to a value of the Rydberg constant which is pretty much dead on with experiment. So this is definitely a very, very insightful model and is really getting to the heart of what's important about the behavior of very small quantum systems.